With BBC Inside Science, here's Adam Rutherford. Hello, a rare treat this week, a COVID-free programme. Instead, we've just got some spectacular cosmos-shaking astrophysics to fill us with awe and wonder and intriguing biological mysteries to solve, such as have you ever wondered how fish, not generally known for walking or flying, arrive in new lakes? Well, we have the answer. But to start, there are few images as awe-inspiring as those of the deep cosmos. Photos of stars, galaxies, constellations and cosmic nebulae are difficult to improve on, but a new book might have done just that, by making them stereoscopic. David Eicher, who is the editor-in-chief of Astronomy magazine, teamed up with the astrophotographer J.P. Metzavanio, all engineered by astrophysicist and stereoscope enthusiast Dr. Brian May, and they've created the first ever book on nebulae in 3D. It's called Cosmic Clouds 3D, Where Stars Are Born, and it's published by the London Stereoscopic Company. I spoke to David and Brian, who you might also know as a guitarist in a band called uh, Queen, it says here, but that's not important right now. And I asked him about the pair of specs that come free with this spectacular book. It's a stereoscope. It's, it's a 21st century stereoscope modelled on a 19th century stereoscope. And really the rules haven't changed since 1832 when Charles Wheatstone discovered the principle. You have to get two slightly different pictures to each of your eyes to reproduce what happens in real life when you're looking at the world around you. You get two slightly different viewpoints which your brain combines into one in-depth image inside your brain. It, it, we all take it for granted, but it's the most amazing magic that's going on inside us the whole time. And, and so the glasses themselves are perspex about the size of a smartphone and it's got two magnifying lenses that you look through. Many of the images in the book are, as you say, these duplicate images next to each other. Talk us through how you actually view it. Yeah, well, you put the little viewer up to your eyes, pretty close up, and then you manoeuvre your head backwards and forwards until the page looks in focus and square up to one of those pairs of pictures and basically relax. And that's the most important thing. Get enough light on it and relax your eyes and imagine that you're looking through the page to infinity. And then suddenly, magically, you will get the 3D image. And it's very, very impressive when you do. Everybody goes, oh, my God, you know, and then you know that they've seen it. Everybody goes, wow, in some form or other. And that's what we live for, us stereoscopists. Yes, and I did it with my kids last night, and we all had that very, that, that, that exact wow moment. Great. You described yourself as a stereoscopist. This is a real thing. How deep is your interest in stereoscopic viewing? Very, very deep. Deeper than you think. <laughs> well, it's been going on since I was a kid and, and I opened up a Weetabix packet and found a little stereoscopic card in there and you had to send away one and sixpence for a viewer, put the card in the viewer and suddenly the whole thing sprang into incredible three dimensions. I was hooked and it's been a big part of my life. I try and incorporate stereoscopy into everything, I guess, but particularly into astronomy. And in astronomy, of course, there are real challenges because how do you get your baseline big enough. Now by baseline I mean the distance between your eyes. That works very well if you've got your hand in front of your face or if you're looking at a flower. But if you try to look at something further away you need to have your eyes further apart in order to get this stereoscopic effect because you need to have the difference between the two views doing that magic in your head. So how do you do that? Well various ways. Inside the solar system you do it because if you wait long enough most things rotate so you get your two separate views. But to cut to the chase, the nebulae are way too far away to be able to do that. There's no way you could get your two cameras, if you like, far enough apart to be able to see the nebulae in three dimensions. So what JP has done, incredibly enterprisingly, has taken his own pictures, number one, which actually rival Hubble in the beauty and detail, and then he applies parallax changes to each little bit of the nebula and the stars in front of it and behind it using the astronomical measurements that have been done on distances. What he does then is alter one of the images. So he's got these pair of images. He will then apply the little corrections to one of the images as if your eyes had moved a billion miles to the left. <laughs> and then the, the two images are put together and they behave like a regular stereo. So what you see is something no man could ever see 
for real, unless he had two eyes a billion miles apart. <laughs> so this is pretty, pretty clever stuff. There's never been a 3D book on nebulae before, and we're very proud. Well, and so you should be, because it's an absolutely beautiful object, and you do get that definite wow factor. So I'm just looking at a... I'm, well, I just flicked it open, and I'm looking at Cone to Rosette here and, and seeing the stereoscopic images next to each other, and I can see, you know, if you focus on one star in the left-hand image, it's two millimetres to the right of the right-hand image. Exactly. Which in, in the universe is several billion miles, presumably. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So this is really combining two of your major life passions, which is astrophysics and stereoscopic viewing. It is. And the book also combines two great minds, the authors, you know, because JP is one of the authors, if you like. The man who wrote the text... David J. Eicher is a world expert on nebulae, so the greatest thing that I did was put those two together and then stand back and watch the fireworks happen. Well, David's on the line with us right now, so let's turn to him. David, what was it like getting a call from uh, from Brian May saying, would you like to do a stereoscopic book on nebulae? Well, it's mind-blowing because for decades, Brian has been a hero of mine, going back to you know when I first saw Queen in 1978 in Cincinnati. And Brian and I had gotten to know each other. And we did a book a couple of years ago called Mission Moon 3D to commemorate the Apollo moon landings. And so it was really after that book that we sort of turned to a favorite subject of mine, the deep space, deep sky, and said, well, what could we do maybe in stereo to address deep space beyond the moon way out there? And fortunately, we found this brilliant astro imager, JP, who Brian knew and knew about. All right, so let, let's just talk about some of the nuts and bolts of the images and of what <laughs> what these stellar nurseries actually are. Many people will be familiar with some of the more famous ones, things like the Horsehead Nebula or the Pillars of Creation, you know, these shockingly beautiful images. But what are we actually looking at? With these nebulae, with these cosmic clouds, we're actually seeing our past and our present and our future because the universe is in the business of recycling. It takes gas and over time compresses gas into stars. But then as stars, just as people, have finite lives, and so they exhaust their material as nuclear reactors, which they are giving us light and heat and energy and life. And in one way or another, they end their lives, and this gas gets recycled. So looking at many of these nebulae, we're looking at stellar birthplaces where new clusters of stars are being born. And in other nebulae, on the other end of the life spectrum, if you will, we're looking at how stars destroy themselves at the end of their lives. But also the very atoms in our bodies came either from the early history of the universe, what's called Big Bang nucleosynthesis, or most of them from the deaths of massive stars that threw more massive atoms out into the galaxy. And eventually some of those atoms ended up literally in our bodies. Which is such an astonishing and you know, just true thing to say that it never it never ceases to amaze me that, as Carl Sagan said, we are made of stardust. So one of the things that's always I've always slightly struggled with, because I'm a mere biologist, I deal in the very, very small, and they tend to be quite wet. But one of the things that has completely baffled me forever when looking at these astonishing images is scale, right? When you know when you look at the Crab Nebula, which is I think the remnants of a supernova. What is the distance we're looking at? Is there anything comparable in the solar system that can give us an idea of how big the lens is here? We're looking at objects that are, with most of these nebulae, a few dozens of light years across. That's about six trillion miles. The small ones, planetary nebulae, are about the same size as our solar system, a couple of light years across. And then, of course, galaxies within which nebulae exist our, well, our galaxy is 100,000 light years across the disk of our galaxy. And you talk about them being, they're packed with, what, gas and dust and debris. Again, just the scale question. When you say gas, is it gas as in just molecules floating around? And when you say debris, what are they? Boulders? Dust? Mostly the nebulae consist, except for the parts where stars are forming, 
of very, very distant atoms of gas that are separated widely. And we can see them so well only because they're so large and many of them are glowing. Now, there are different types of nebulae. Emission nebulae, which are forming new stars, the stellar birthplaces, they're glowing literally like a fluorescent light bulb glows the same way. But other nebulae, dark nebulae, the horsehead nebula, those are very fine dust particles that we're seeing only because they're blocking light from objects beyond. And you can see this dark nebulosity from a dark sky if you just look up at the band of the Milky Way. You can see some of that dark nebulosity throughout that hazy band of light. So when we see these images, and we just mentioned the Crab Nebulae, which is the remnants of an exploded star, a supernovae, but we talk about these other nebulae as being nurseries or the birthplace of stars. What is that process? How do those big dust clouds become things that we you know have a much sort of more tenable understanding of it is and the short answer to that question is gravity because of course as most things are moving away from each other in the universe most galaxies gravity on local and small scales pulls gas and other things together and that's how the recycling that's how new generations of stars are born and we don't know you know where did the atoms come from in our bodies exactly hydrogen and helium from big bang nucleosynthesis early in the universe most all the other heavier elements much later from exploding massive star supernovae Neutron stars are the producers of things like gold and platinum, but we don't know exactly how many generations, but probably several, because the massive stars that are really heavy have short lifetimes of only a few hundred million years or a few million years. The meek, quiet, faint stars go on and on and on. If I could just throw something back at you, Adam, you know, I, I was <laughs> kind of touched earlier on when you said you deal with something very small and we deal with something very big. But actually, we deal with something which is very elemental and on a chemistry level, very simple on the whole. Your tiny little amoeba is a billion times more complex than anything we ever deal with. And, you know, in, in a way, that amoeba and the humans that we are are the results of this creation that's going on in the nebulae. But it's the absolute pinnacle of, of creation, isn't it? Anything that has life in it is a much, much more complex situation to understand. Well, that's a very generous way of phrasing it, and I, and I like that sort of holistic view. Now, Brian, just a final question to you. I, I mentioned that this is bringing together two of your passions. Many people will know that you were an undergraduate astrophysicist, and I believe you started a PhD, had a short break and then returned to it in the 2000s. No, nobody really knows what you were doing during that time. Yeah, a uh, short break of about 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, is this the sort of enduring passion that you want to bring more people into astrophysics through the beauty of these astonishing images and the amazing science that underlies them? Yeah, I think just looking at nebulae and, and saying to people in the street, you know, what do you understand by a nebula is where this book starts. And I think people are really intrigued to know what they really are. Well, I think everyone could do with a little bit more stardust in their lives, right, in these dark days. Yeah, that's right. A bit more Joni Mitchell, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> she said, we are stardust, we are gold. I put that in my PhD. Yeah, dust was my thing in, in the PhD, as you may know. Brian May and David Iker. Cosmic Clouds 3D, where stars are born, is out now, and it is a truly lovely thing. BBC Inside Science at bbc.co.uk if you want to get in touch.